Welcome to Christian Statesman. I'm your host, Zach Wagner, and this is episode 79, America and the Race of Nations. There are a number of analogies that might help us understand our current situation here in America. If you are under 40, you have only known the world as it has progressed into a wired digital age, shrinking the globe into a conglomeration of nations. You may not understand just how far ahead America was some decades ago in comparison to the rest of the world. In a way, the rise of the Internet and the information age has spurred the ability to, to connect across the planet in ways heretofore unimaginable. In other ways, information has been used against us to paint pictures of things as they really are not. In other words, deception is as prevalent as truth and fact. Not all nations and cultures are equal. As much as we would hope and wish they were, history will not support such a premise. The Enlightenment of the 1600s and beyond affected, for the most part, European cultures, helping them raise out of autocratic monarchies into a more modern democratic age. This, unfortunately, has not translated into other areas of the world as both the standards of individual education and freedom, encouraging responsible self-governance, still lack in many corners of the globe. For example, when Mao passed away in 1976, China barely qualified as what we would classify as a third world autocratic country. It was a century behind the rest of the world, much as North Korea lags behind in many respects today. The United States over the last century and a half has led the pack, spurred by principles of individualism, liberty, and entrepreneurship. Nearly every modern development and convenience has had its concept developed in the crucible of American ingenuity. For decades we have led the way, but our momentum is waning rapidly, having been eroded from within by the greed and corruption that can accompany such freedoms. Combined with infiltrating foreign influence, seeking to redistribute and then eventually crater our wealth-producing capability, the situation deteriorates. Let us view the nations of the world as a group of bicycle racers, racing in an elite format such as the Tour de France. Like any such race, the prize that goes to the winner is wealth, influence, and recognition. America has led the pack of racers for over a century. We've been the example of a well-disciplined, well-nourished elite athlete. Our supportive team has been fed by the precepts of liberty, open markets, and the ability to utilize entrepreneurial ideas in that market. Innovation and the rise of a solid middle class has fueled our lead among all nations. Never in the history of man could an average citizen with a little education, time, and work build a lifestyle and level of prosperity that exceeded royalty in many countries just a few centuries ago. We've led the way for other nations to accelerate in our draft. Our European cousins, for example, at least until the socialist ethic of the European Union set them back a ways, coasted in our draft for many years. But other nations were eyeing our substantial lead and sought to surpass us and claim the prize of world's best for their own. But they are not content to try and outwork us or cooperate for our mutual benefit. They hope to dash our competitive nature to pieces. So they slip poison into our food and our water, weakening us as we continue to run the race. We've become burdened with overregulation, corruption, the loss of cohesive national identity and work ethic. We are now entering a generation of gender-confused, politically correct weaklings who have forgotten where our strength originated from. We are a nation that has completely lost its moral compass, unable to even navigate the road coming up ahead. And as we are eaten away from within and without, our strength is waning. Our legs are barely able to pump the pedals. Our lead is faded. Individually, we may perceive that all is well since our bicycle still rolls along at speed. But unless we receive some pretty serious assistance in terms of better economic nutrition or even moral medical help, we will soon lose all momentum and coast to a stop. Other racers, adversarial to our desires to lead and win, will overtake us, or worse, push us off the side of the road and smash our bicycle if they get the opportunity, anxious to see that we never race again. In such a contest, our situation is dire. Without some pointed intervention, we may soon be out of the race completely. Our body was strong, our training elite. And we have demonstrated these fundamentals for some time in the past. But without a revival of our spirit and our strength, our race may soon be over. 
Who will take charge of our rider and team? Who will step up and purge the poison from our system? Feed us with nutritional truth and moral strength and get our legs spinning again. Is there hope for us? Or will we face the inevitability of a race we led so for so long but could not ultimately finish in the long run? It seems we have some of our own crew, our supposed supportive teammates that yearn to see us drop out of the race. That internal division from any perspective is simply unacceptable. We need help in reviving our race efforts and recovering our strength or otherwise. In a time not far in the future, we will only be a footnote to the great race of history, a byline in the wide expansive narrative of national antiquities. Though we may have been yesterday's hero, we risk becoming an historical has-been. Time to take a serious look at the state of this race and how to get back in it. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe, tell your friends, and as always, have a blessed day.